Good evening. I am very, very delighted to be here with you in this unique opportunity to meet as he was the Baltan Laboratory and the Dutch Design Week. And what makes me really happy, what I noticed from the speakers, we are all caring. We are all caring more than about us, ourselves. We are caring for a better world, and that is unique. So I'm really very delighted that we are here. We have a very inspiring evening together. And, and a lot of people came here with, with um, train problems or um, a lot of traffic jams. So thank you that you are still here. And um, <clears throat> I want especially to start with a big thank you. So Olga, where is Olga? <laughs> Olga, <laughs> Ellen, where is Ellen? So. Uh, Olga from the Walton Laboratory, Ellen from uh, Age of Wonderland, and Christine Wagner, please. Can you also show? These three ladies... <laughs> these three ladies made it happen that we are here together and that we have the unique opportunity to be together one evening to think about challenging our food system. And you, you came in and you had to choose what is the major challenge and I saw that you choose for food as a natural resource. So we will, um, we will uh, explore it further. And next to me is my wonderful colleague Amis. Hello. We are both doing... Hello. <laughs> we, are, we are doing it together. So we are... Um, we, we, Guarantee you an um, interactive, beautiful evening. Okay, now um, I, want just, uh, I want to ask the first speaker. It is Carol. Uh, Carol Gebnau, she is the director of the, um, of the Green Department in Hivos. And she really thinks about how to, set the, uh, how to bring the food system into a new area. And she cares for the future, of, for the future of the next generation as a mother, and she will now give us an introductory speech. So thank you all for this, uh, well, for the honor of starting this uh, this very interesting evening. I'm also very happy being here in the Nat Lab, which is known by many as a center of innovation and I think that's really well encouraging and inspiring to be in such a center because I think this is really about well as Barbara already mentioned how can we challenge current thinking about food I mean there's a lot going on on food uh, but somehow the discussions and solutions seem to get stuck once in a while so we hope that this inspiring place which is known for its innovation will help us to take next steps. Um, food, the topic of this, uh, this workshop, of this seminar, is really becoming very trendy and fancy and inspires many to do all sorts of innovations. Uh, and most of you probably have a few of them in your homes. Um, this is not really the kind of innovation which me or which HIVOS, the organization I work for, is, is really uh, looking for. I think what we're really looking for is more like how can we bring together really different perspectives, different people, thinking about same problems and solutions but from very different corners of the world, from very different backgrounds, and to see if that can lead to unexpected insights uh, and new ideas. And I think this place is known also for that. Um, a little bit about HIVOS and food. Um, HIVOS uh, has recognized that there's really a dire need to challenge the current debate and current thinking about food. We've worked for many, many years in the food domain. We have looked at ways to make food production more sustainable. We have looked at ways to uh, and strengthen the position of small-scale farmers in developing countries. We've looked at how can we change markets in such a way that they really value sustainable production. And what we have recognized is, uh, yes, we saw some changes 
But we really recognized that we needed to shift our attention to really look at the whole food system, uh, not just the production side of it. Um, because what we saw is that the impact of what we are doing, or were doing, and also what others were doing, doing similar kind of programs, was just too limited. Progress was too slow, and we also felt that some key issues were really unaddressed. And we felt while discussing and exploring what would be our new direction, we really felt a sense of urgency, and also a need to really step up our ambitions. Um, and we also realized that in order for change to really happen, we need, really need to break the silos and look for new ways of thinking and working together for systemic change. Because let's face it, and that's the other slide, <laughs> we think that our food system is really in deep problems. We are eating our own planet and what we are eating is destroying our health. That's a very brief slogan of, well, summarizing our thinking. And let me elaborate on this a little bit deeper. Yeah. So what we see if we look at the food system is that some, well, almost one billion people are going hungry. And the interesting thing is that around 70, 80 percent of them are small-scale producers. So people who are producing food are facing hunger. It's very weird. I mean, we feel that really a system that is creating such kind of uh, well, results is a highly unequal system. So that's the first figure on top. What we also see is that 11 percent of the global population is undernourished. They're not eating enough calories. And even more are not eating enough micronutrients, so they're malnourished. It's almost a double figure. What is also interesting is that there's a growing challenge that uh, overweight and obese has doubled since the 1980s. It's weird. I mean, thinking about a system that on the one hand produces, you know, or, or leads to people being undernourished and on the other hand leading to people being overweight or obese. A system that creates such negative results on both extremes we think is a very sick system. Then the last thing on eating the planet, 52% of the land used for agriculture is affected by soil degradation. So in a way we're wasting the soil, which is the very fundamental basis of our whole food system. Arable land is being lost at tremendous rates. So a system that is eating the very resources we're depending upon for our future food production is a system that really undermines everything and each and everybody's life. So this is a bit about the problems. Um, but then, how to move away from that? how to move from problems to solutions. What's interesting is that most of the figures I mentioned and the problems are known to most people who deal with the food issue. Um, so we agree on problems, we agree on the figures, but then when it comes to the solutions, there is a very big diversity of opinions. The topic is very highly debated, I mean, by experts, agri-food companies, governments, ordinary citizens and is really marked by a very high degree of polarization. I mean, it's really about is small or is big beautiful? Small-scale farmers or big agricultural companies? Should it be more natural-based or do we look for industrial solutions? So these are really two kind of extremes in the same kind of debate and it seems very difficult to overcome the different polarized opinions in the debate. It's often also very much driven by institutional interest and power. But food, in the end, is not a domain of experts alone. I mean, in our view, we should look much more at what the system is delivering for humanity. Is the system really creating the results we as citizens or as consumers want? I mean, if I look at myself, I'm, yeah, I'm working on food as an, well, well, some might call me an expert, I don't think I'm an expert, but still. But I'm also 
a mother of two children, and I want to see my children grow up, become healthy, and I also want to know that they grow up in a world that is not getting worse. I mean, I want to have them, you know, a nice future. And what I see happening is not a very nice future, and I'm trying to make choices that are also in their interest, but then faced with a system that is not really helping me to make the right choices for me, my ch children, nor for society. So if I bring myself into the debate, so not as an expert, but as a human being, there's a different kind of debate happening. And I'm not alone. I mean, I know many people, and I, I mean, that's also why it's so interesting to see that for this event, we didn't expect so many people to turn up. I mean, it really shows that food is really a concern for many, many people, and not just what we consider experts. I mean, we see new movements coming up. Uh, you all know the slow food movement and the youth food movement. There are all sorts of blogs about healthy food and how to green food and so on. You also see new companies with new kinds of business models coming up to really see how they can really work on making our food system more sustainable. So what we desperately need in the food debate is to move from an expert perspective to a more human perspective. Because food is not just about calories and micronutrients, which is often the topic of debate with experts. People are no engines where you just put in some fuel and then they start running. I mean, food is much more than just providing energy for us to keep going. Food connects us. It addresses not only a basic need, but also it's about how we shape society, how we want to interact with our families and friends, and also in our relationship with nature. So if we feel that bringing in the human perspective can maybe be the bridge between the theory and the analytical frameworks often debated and the practice, and between agreeing on problems and agreeing on a way forward that helps us all as citizens. So this is the challenge HIVOS has taken up. And that's also what makes this collaboration between HIVOS, NATLAB and the Dutch Design Week uh, around the Age of Wonderland initiative for us, a very interesting initiative. Uh, and also you will hear other initiatives and other perceptions from the different speakers talking to you later on. So we hope that by working together, we really can bring in new perspective because that's highly needed in the current debate around food. But we also would like to invite you, the audience, uh, who we also consider as all experts on this topic, to bring in your ideas and your thoughts. And, I mean, to know how do you work on improving the food system? I mean, at the entrance, you got some, a, a small paper, and that's a way to invite you to share how you see innovation in the food system and how you are working on it, to share that with us. Because for us, it's important to also be inspired by all of you and really thinking about the food system and what could be done. Um, I think this is the last. <coughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you can go to the next one. So my statement was about eating our planet, that we're eating our planet and what we're eating is destroying our health. But this is not a story of despair. It's a story of hope. Because human beings have not only created these problems, but in the end, they are also the ones able to solve the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. Before, before we move to the next speaker, who's a, one, who's a wonderful speaker, I would just to ask you, no, no, I want to have this one. Um, sorry, <laughs> I just want to think one minute about the question that Carol wanted to uh, answer up. So what is your solution of, for a sustainable system? You got, the, you got these cards. Can you just think for one minute and what is your solution? And afterwards we collect it from um, um, outside. <laughs> Okay, thanks.
thanks for your for uh, thanks for the collective wisdom in the room. We will uh, collect it afterwards. And now, I have the honor. To, most of them, you of course, know Arne, but uh, I have the honor to uh, introduce Arne. Arne is an artist and a an researcher, and he was the um, ambassador of the Dutch Design Week from last year. And he cares for, if I understood you correctly, how to um, how to uh, embrace scarcity and make it really as a movement. How to embrace less, yes. We have to teach ourselves how to embrace less. And that's basically how I live my life more and more, is just to educate myself how to embrace less and do away with all that more all the time and to just, you know, be happy with what we have. It's a, a general statement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I give you the floor. Do I need this? Yeah. So, <clears throat> sorry? You think so? I can I don't know. But, but it's, I think it's for a recording. So um, a few years ago, some of you might have seen this photograph, just uh, after the tsunami uh, in the Fukushima district uh, hit the shores, um, I came across this photograph uh, of a young family and, um, well, in the middle of the rubble, uh, left after the devastating effect of the natural disaster, we see this young woman with a baby. on her back preparing a simple meal on a makeshift stove. I can't stop looking at that photograph. The captured moment represents what fascinates me most, uh, or most fundamentally about food. And that is how it allows us to, or perhaps how it makes it impossible not to, be human. It doesn't matter in what situation mankind finds itself, uh, it will always organize itself, mediate itself, express itself uh, around food. Or perhaps better said, through food. Uh, as you can see, it only takes fire, a few pots and pans, some simple ingredients. And we're able to read this image as a new beginning of man's survival, man's ability to prevail. In, in all its chaos, this image mediates hope. Even if we are hit by tidal waves, radioactive clouds, we shall overcome. All we need is the availability of a little food and culture is reinstalled. That's what I see in this image. That's why this image sort of always emotionally really touches me. I can see this image every day. And I remember that's exactly why I'm interested in food. I'm moved by the strength that is expressed through this image. It identifies food as the primary medium through which we express our humanity. The primary medium through which we express our humanity. To be clear, I'm not even speaking of the food itself. I'm speaking of our interaction with it, its presence, its distribution and preparation, its symbolic strength in times of crisis, as well as abundance. We paint and sculpt the world with food. Sure, with a little imagination or time, the wasteland this family finds itself in could represent the whole earth. And the gesture of cooking on top of that pile of rubble as an act of a fool. Unwilling to change. Oblivious, oblivious to what happens around her. And yes, perhaps the slow tsunami we speak of here tonight is how we farm, how we distribute, how we consume. Yet, it pre I prefer to read this image as a sign of our ability to overcome our fear. If she can, why can't we? I'm talking about fear. Why wouldn't we be able to overcome the destructive and unfair system, systems we've allowed to be put in place? What are we afraid of? Each day mankind expresses itself through billions and billions of food-related gestures, actions and thoughts. For better or for worse, it's almost impossible to exaggerate this global choreography. I was recently in a workshop. Kurt, you're always there, also there. I was in this workshop together with food engineers from one of the world's largest food producers, and they mentioned that their clients each day create two billion, two billion, their clients of this one company, each day create two billion interactions with their products. Millions of hands going into bags of potato chips, dipping tea bags into hot water, putting butter on toast, I mean simple stuff, right? That in itself seems to me a symphony so loud and majestic that even the slightest change in how we interact could cause a tsunami of an altogether different nature. 
But it's not all about qu quantity, of course. If it was, then what would the individual designer or artist or consumer be able to do? When I think of the storytelling power of the individual, I think of Wheatland by Agnes Deans. That's the next slide. I mean, most of you might know this. I think about this slide also, quite often. When I think of the individual possibility to act. In 1982, she planted an empty allotment in the middle of bankrupt New York, just two blocks away with, of Wall Street with wheat, and together with the city, watch it grow into this golden abundance. After its harvest, the seeds were spread to be planted around the world. She went around the world in a tour and she spread those seeds. <clears throat> That's a strong message. I'm sure you can figure out for yourself. I don't have to explain. It shows us how important it is that we as individuals express ourselves through food. And for that, we need to be intimate with it and listen to what it has to say to us. If food is a medium, then how do we learn to speak its language? How can we trust what it whispers into our ears? I'm reminded here of a short story by the writer Franz Kafka, who of course you all know. It's called A Hunger Artist, which he published in 1922, and it describes that typical early 20th century phenomenon of the hunger performer. People making a public display, display of their ability to go without food for a very, very long time, up to 40 days. Sitting in public spaces without a single meal. In this book, the hunger artist says, and I quote, and you can read with me, because that's always easier, so I just jumped right into the story, right? And you will catch what it is about, I think. Such suspicions, anyhow, were a necessary accompaniment to the profession of fasting. No one could possibly watch the hunger artist continuously, day and night. And so no one could produce first-hand evidence that the fast had really been rigorous and continuous. Only the artist himself could know that. He was therefore bound to be the sole completely satisfied spectator of his own fast. Yet for other reasons, he was never satisfied. It was not perhaps mere fasting that had brought him to such skeleton thinness that many people had regretfully to keep away from his exhibitions because the sight of him was too much for them. Perhaps it was dissatisfaction with himself that had worn him down. For he alone knew, what no other initiate knew, how easy it was to fast. It was the easiest thing in the world. So basically this man was... <coughs> not satisfied with himself. I think that's an inter interesting quote. There's many ways you can read it. I'll just let you, you know, put your own meaning to it. The problem here is that nobody trusted that he did not eat. How could we? But the bigger problem is that he didn't even trust himself. He didn't think his, actions wa his action was worthy and that in this story is what ultimately kills him. So that's the depressing end of that story. He, he, he dies. No. I gave away the clue, I'm sorry. But there's a lesson here that seems more important to me because I often get the impression we're sort of waiting for the other to make the first step. Or we don't trust ourselves in taking that first step. How do we then deal with this mistrust? Us, the artists and designers, and the artists and designers that each of us become in our participation in the hundreds of billions of tiny gestures that we make each day related to food. When we open a bag of chips or bite into an apple or fry a piece of chicken, how do we move beyond the state of inertia this lack of belief creates? The story of the hunger artist is a dramatic example, I know. The point is that we need to overcome our incredible and deeply rooted disbelief that we can actually do something amazing. Even or especially the sort of disbelief that is irrational or even dishonest or worse even indifferent. How do we overcome it? Starting with our own. If we can overcome our disbelief and our fear then this may start the change needed. If food is indeed both medium and message, then each of those pub daily thousands of billions of food-related gestures has a performer and the public. Each time we open a bag of chips or buy a carrot or fry a chicken, we're part of a global piece of performance art. Each gesture performs our humanity, for good and for bad. Even if it's just you telling that story, and it feels like you're not having direct impact on global affairs, it can still be a good story. And I truly believe that good stories travel. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I now would like to, um, to ask Carol and Anne to sit over there. <clears throat> 
Uh, can you come? Yeah, sit over there. Anna, can you come? Because uh, the next one, the, yeah, exactly. Because we have a special um, guest that will now reflect on the two statements before we all go to reflect on it in, a, in an interactive way. And we have the honor that Kurt von, um, von Mansford is here with us. And um, he, will, um, he is a designer and a philosopher. That's right. And uh, you care most for? Well, all my work resolves around the topic of next nature, which relates to how technology is so omnipresent, also today. Uh, it's all around us that it becomes this nature of its own. And when we're talking about the food system, then I think there's also some dynamics going on in that respect. But tonight I'm here to improvise, so I'm not giving this prepared lecture. Because if you see his lectures, you will not have a presentation afterwards because they are so fantastic. So then, so we they, today tonight we challenge you in an improvising way to give feedback on the uh, to reflect on the two statements. Right, and uh, as I see it, I, I'm the one uh, being invited to open the floor because I think there's also room for questions from the audience. Right? Yes, but um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Ah, then we'll let limit it. Okay. Well, how much time do we do? Do we have? In total, we have ten minutes. All right. That's a lot. Twelve minutes. So you have. Um, so you get three, and then the interaction takes place. There. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Carol and uh, Arne, for your uh, presentations. Um, as I already said, I'm here to improvise, and it's quite uh, interesting to sit here and then think, oh, now I should give a reflection. Um, but important things have been said already uh, to begin with. And I, being, I think the main thing you pointed out, Arne, also, is uh, that food is one of the most intimate things that we have in our lives. You literally put something from, from the outside world in your body. Um, so that's, that's it, as intimate as it gets. And, at the same, same, hand, same time, also food or cooking is already a technology. We don't perceive it as that today, but there has been this moment in the human history that cooking was an invention and preparing our food allowed us to intake more calories in less time. Um, and as a result, we got more energy, were able to grow bigger brains, socialize more, and basically become more modern human beings. So it's that relation between this intimate thing, which has always, from the very first day that we have been human, already been technological, uh, but now things seem to be running out of hand. And I think what you pointed out, Carol, about uh, uh, that we are all experts is extremely important because too much of the food system has been left to engineers who are thinking in one-dimensional ways of indeed putting nutrients in our body as a machine. And this is what we have to um, move away from. I think there's one question I would like to ask uh, to the both of you, um, which is that we have to make this first step to change things, right? And my suggestion would be as a first step, because, Carol, you, you talked about the, 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 the food system, also the institutionalized role of how this food system is playing. My suggestion would be to look at what feeds the system. You know? If we want to change the system, we have to begin with what feeds it. What is the metabolism of the system? And this is not eating grain. Definitely not. It's other stuff. But what is it? And how does that function? And maybe if we can feed the system in a different way, we can make a step. But that's that's my question to you. So you want to respond? You, you oh, first? Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, yeah. No, ladies, ladies first. first. Ladies first? She's going to say what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> just then, you, then you just think of something else. You get to go, yeah. Wow, difficult question about how, what we should feed the system to, ch to make a change. Well, what is driving the current... The metabolism of the system, what, what feeds it, and how uh -huh. can we change that? Yeah. Yeah, I think what's driving a lot of systems and also the food system is, uh, is money, very much. Uh, that's why I very much like this idea of less. I mean, because if we all decide to consume less or different things, I think we can change that system. Because as consumers, we're the ones buying all the stuff coming out of that system. So as a consumer, every day you have a choice. I have a difficulty here. Uh, 
Because I notice it in my own life, and I'm sure other people also have this, is that on the one hand, I am the citizen, you know, and I think about the world, and I reflect on it, and I have this moral position and obligation, and then I think, yes, yes, I should consume less, change my behavior. But then I, I'm the consumer as well. Uh, I, I walk into a supermarket and I buy stuff in, in a weak moment, maybe, and pff, that happens as well. So, and, and especially that consumer, how do you relate to that? Maybe you can respond to that. I don't know, Kurt. I mean, that's just like saying, oh, well, you know, I have a weak moment, so we're not going to change the system. It is not, it's not enough. But I, I do agree with you that I have these impulses myself. You know, it's, it's, I mean, we all do. But it is not so much about, oh, I have to do this. We have to find systems how we actually want to do it. I want to desire less. So I'm not saying that I have a solution for this. I'm just, try I'm just trying to point out that I'm looking for those things. I'm trying to find those very rare moments in my life, in society, where I think, hey, I actually want that less. I want less in this way. And, uh, and I think to come back to your first question, I think what, and I, I think I said something about it in the talk, is um, I think what feeds the system is fear. Fear that we might not have enough. Fear that the other will have something that we won't have. Um, and somehow we have to offer, overcome this fear because it's actually fear that is designing our food systems. It is not the scarcity that is feeding it because the world is an abundant place and we know we can all do a lot of things. But it is the fear of scarcity that's designing. And that's a difference because fear is an irrational thing. So I think our world is being designed by something irrational. It's like, it's like letting God decide, you know, how we decide our world. And we've, we've tried that and it didn't really work. So let's not have fear replace God and do it again. You know, I think we should really overcome and just grow as human beings. I mean, are we going to stay here? Are we going to be this shallow or are we going to become, you know, something else? That's just what we want to do. And then I'm sure that you will also want to, uh, you know, take along if you feel that people are growing in that sense, although maybe into less. This is an ideal moment with your inspiration to go back to you. <laughs> So I would like to, because you get so much inspiration, it's at least for me. So I would like now to ask you to discuss with your neighbor three minutes about what do you think about celebrating less and we are eating our own planet and what we are eating is destroying our health. And afterwards I want to get, um, I want to get the votes which position you choose. So the pro or the uh, the pro or contra, and you have the and you have the honor. The ones that are most brave can come for a bilateral talk to talk to Carol, to Arne, and to Kurt. Right now. Right now. Yeah. Yes, we know it's a crazy talk. <laughs> 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 yeah. But uh, you can sort of think of it as a substance that you can mold. Change. I just want to think like that. Although, yeah. Yeah. I, All right. I want to. So sorry to interrupt. It always takes a while before people start talking and then they will never stop. <laughs> so thank you brave people for coming up so you can take your seats again. <laughs> because uh, of course you don't have to choose one or the other. Um, we just wonder if there's anybody that is actually against one of these two. So maybe, um, uh, yeah, let's start with the first one, uh, green or, or yellow. So obviously green would be yes, uh, green or red. So green we are yes, we are in favor and uh, red would be no, we are not. So anybody who dares to put up the, the red one? <laughs> oh, there's a red one in the back there. So do, does everybody have a card, or are you just uh, shy to uh, to bring them out? So this would be the moment if you have a card to uh, to show to me. Oh, there's some red coming up. That's good. We are eating our own planet, and what we are eating is destroying our health. Is a statement. Are we in favor of that statement or not? 
Yes, so we do not have to choose because they don't necessarily exclude one another. So we're not choosing between the statements, we're actually voting uh, separately on each of the statements. Ah, that's also true. So let's move on to, let's celebrate less. Um, are we in favor of that statement or do we want to have more? I see some greedy people here, that's good. Great. So, thank you. Um, I think time-wise we'll move on to the next speaker, but there will be time for more of these buzzing and uh, uh, discussions. Um, we, have a, we have a wonderful next speaker. That is Klaas de Vries. Klaas. Klaas comes from the University of Wageningen. He is advisor for... Uh, food and nutrition security. Yeah, so for health and related to that, that people also have a, uh, a, good livelihood, a good livelihood, ideally, and that relates to nutrition security, which is what I'm going to uh, emphasize for tonight. Ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bobo. Uh, good evening. And um, can you stand on the yellow dot? Yes, the yellow dot, Around sorry. Yellow dot. I'll try not to uh, move the yellow dot. Um, uh, good evening. Um, so. Like Bebel said, I work for the Center for Development and Innovation in Wageningen. Um, we're kind of a, supposed to be, to be a bridge between the, uh, the univer what the university does and, and what happens in the real world, so to speak. Um, I, I started to work there uh, three and a half years ago, and when I arrived, I had the opportunity to look around in the, in the organization. Um, what do I want to work on? Can, is it environment? Is it um, monitoring and evaluation? Is it uh, multi-stakeholder processes? But I started talking with people in the, in the nutrition department and there was really a buzz, a momentum uh, there in, uh, on that topic uh, starting in the development uh, agenda. So I got interested and one of the first things that they taught me is that there is no food security without nutrition security. If you look at the definition of the, uh, that is generally accepted from the FAO, it says food security accept, uh, exists when all people at all time have access to nutritious foods. So there is no food security without uh, nutrition security. And I'll talk about that a bit more. Also, like Carol also already said, 805 million people worldwide are chronically undernourished. Um, and that means that people regularly struggle to get the dietary intake that they need to live a healthy life. Um, and this is often hidden hunger. Um, that means it's very hard to see. If you walk the streets in take Indonesia, for example, uh, you'll see children running around and you won't think that there's something wrong with them, they're smiling. Uh, but then when you ask them, how old are you? You think somebody is seven years old, but they say, I'm, I'm 10. And it's because of the height that you see that, but it's more than height. It's, uh, well, for example, 80 million babies are more mentally impaired because of iodine deficiency, iodine being yodium. Um, and, it's, and it also relates to child mortality. 600 malnutrition related deaths per hour. 45% of all uh, children that die under five can be related to nutrition. And this is not just because of starvation, but because people are more prone to disease like um, diarrhea, or very much uh, uh, related to, uh, uh, for example, malaria, no resistance against that. And it's, well, also related to we are eating uh, not healthy, the staple crops. Uh, staple crops, uh, if you go to Ghana, for example, people are uh, eating enough in terms of calories, but they don't get the micronutrients and that because in many countries, the, our food systems are geared towards eating staple crops and producing staple crops. And like also, like Carol already addressed in her uh, presentation, there's a double burden now because what we see in, in the same countries where we see undernourishment, people are getting overweight. Um, and this rate at which people are getting uh, overweight is, is higher than the rate at which uh, uh, undernourishment is, is decreasing. 
So in the end, we're ending up with a bigger uh, malnutrition problem than there is now. So to give you uh, an idea, of course, it's, it's the usual suspects where these problems are, are occurring. Uh, this is for uh, anemia, uh, blood armoede. Every year, um, 50,000 uh, women, for example, are dying in childbirth just because of anemia, iron deficiency. So an important micronutrient. And the countries that you just saw in that map, 17% uh, of the people uh, in those countries depend largely on agriculture for their, for their daily livelihood. Um, so what better way than to link nutrition to agriculture? Uh, it's, it's being rated a very cost-effective uh, 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 way of intervening. Uh, if you invest one euro, you get it back 16-fold, which is a conclusion from the Global Nutrition Report from last year. And the recent estimates are even higher. Um, so we really need to change our food systems first and foremost to arrive at that. We need to increase the production of nutritious foods. By 2050, there are 9 billion people on the planet, and we need to produce two to three times more food in order to feed them if we maintain our current consumption patterns. Um, and we need to do that sustainably because we don't get more land to do that. And with the same amount of land as we have now, we need to produce that food. And we need to take into account local diets because, well, it's the consumers that have to eat this food. So it, do it doesn't make sense if we, uh, there's no one, si uh, uh, one size fits all in terms of uh, consumption uh, pref um, preferences. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, we need to take a multi-sectoral approach in doing this. So next to it's not just agriculture that that is driving this. We need the water and sanitation and health people. We need education to raise awareness. We need the infrastructure because our cities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we need the infrastructure to bring it from the rural areas to the cities. And we need all players on board. Uh, and this is also very much challenging, like in the, um, the sectors where the ministries are not all working together. We need to break those silos for all players on board. It's the civil society and government knowledge institutes, private sector are not speaking the same language. So that's a big problem. And we need civil society to empower the, the farmers. We need the governments to stop focusing just on uh, staple crop uh, farming systems and stimulating that. We need the knowledge institutes to show what is working and what isn't. And we need the private sector to produce and market the food that we need. On, on the bottom of the screen you see the women. The women are, are the key to the solution. They are the ones that feed the children and it's an intergenerational problem. They are also affected by these, uh, like I said, the anemia, the 50,000 deaths each year. And I want to take out the private sector as one of, uh, as the key, one of the key uh, players here, because this is a very much a changing dynamic in food security. A few years ago, the private sector was not interested in the developing countries, and now we see them coming up. It used to be an object, and now it's becoming a partner more and more in food uh, security-related projects. Because it's the largest food producer in the world, and it has the resources and innovation power to change the farming systems that we need to change. And the private sector, of course, is driven by business models. And a lot of the times, people are pointing their fingers at the private sector for wanting money. But it's also, it can also be an asset. Um, if a farming system can survive sustainably because uh, the, the private sector sees a business in it, it can sustain itself without support from outside. And if, that makes it sustainable in that way. So therefore, my, my statement is, we will only achieve food security if the private sector develops business cases to produce food, uh, to produce and market nutritious foods in developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Klaas. Before we go into um, the discussion, you can sit already over there. And I would like to ask Jojo to come with me.
It's an honor that you are here, and I'm really very delighted. Yuyu is coming from a kingdom in, oh, we have to stand here. Um, ah, you want to have it here? Yeah, okay. Yoyo is coming from a kingdom in Indonesia, and you take care most about? About how to plant rice following the star cycle. I give you the floor. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hello. This is the program of <clears throat> as of Wonderland, isn't it? Would you like to please to number one? Here I come from the kingdom from above, but this is only two villages. We have 568 villages. This is only two, one and two. So we have 668 villages. Can you imagine? We are living at three sub-district area, which is uh, perhaps sometimes, someday you see. Where is Bogor, is Lebak, where is uh, Sukabumi, living with us uh, around 30, just 30,000 people inside who's keeping in the tradition and ancient tradition. I'm going to talk about Pranata Mangsa, which is also related to the age of Wonderland. This is the age, this is the time. I come from Wonderland. You see? It's wonder. Kasepuhan Cipta Gelar, which is also a kind of like kingdom system, the way of living and life, the way of life and thinking also. We follow everything just following the role of the, of the ancestor. We don't do anything without uh, creation, any creation. We, do, we don't create anything. We don't have any expectation, only just do what we're supposed to do as a generation to regenerate from what the, ascent, the ancestor do. Nyoryang alam ka tukang nyawang mangsan bakal datang. This is uh, revisiting the past in order to see the glimpse in our future. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Agriculture, agriculture, sorry, <coughs> my English, I hope you understand about my, my English is not so good, but it's just enough to say something, which is uh, in our tradition. <laughs> we are following, we can say, uh, we are following the cycle of the nature. We are following the cycle of the star start telling us everything in the in the way of planting if we follow, we follow the stars which is also we follow the cycle of the life 
we don't we will not ever use any pesticide at all because star will telling us when we have to plant when we don't have to when we have to stop to plant but also when is the timing for the insect will be breeding but the rest will be breeding which is not uh, which is if we plant in the wrong timing the insect will come and people will use pesticide to kill and we just also we will eat that pesticide for us here see kerti and also kidang we call kerti which is also in international uh, words uh, this is the Pleiades Pleiades yeah perhaps and also Kidang is a uh, Orion Nebula for some people who still keeping in the ancient tradition they still use it for the planting not for life cycle not for daily activities because for day day, day life activities we only use sun and the moon special for star it is for planting also for the the direction if uh, someone who's living in the ocean in yeah for fishing uh tanggal kerti turun wesi tanggal kidang turun kujang surup kidang turun kungkang this is also telling us the timing when we have to get ready we have we have to starting to work on the rice field and also when is the timing not to plan because the time for the insect breeding and also all talking about rice we have to use everything by manual at the other concept because rice is the food for human not the food for machine so we don't use machine to bring rice even we have car we have motorcycle no matter how long how how far we have this rice we have to carry by ourselves so because we work hard there is no people who has too much fat <laughs> even we eat a lot so it's just like a kind of like balance um sorry yes please <coughs> I lost my voice. Please <coughs> continue. Yeah. <coughs> Everything about rice talk, uh, is more talking about life. Rice alive because of us. We alive because of rice that in our place of course it will be different with here but also let's see something perhaps is uh, there is something we it's uh, useful also or related to to here i mean talking about rice talking about life talking about the power who make us alive so don't forget to thanks to the earth as a mother and to the sky as a father so everything we do with rituals and rituals and rituals we don't talk about uh, religion in this way okay because talking about the uh, ancient tradition and also this is the the starting to plant rice and after a couple months then we got that much rice and also we still do the ritual this is a uh, the ritual of pengasuk which is also initial paddy planting tradition at the, uh, our kingdom the name is cipta gelar don't forget to write it down cipta gelar also related to the age of wonderland and also the time to sow something from the wonderland to see something gelar which is to sow because our kingdom okay existed since 1368 but we just we have to hide it then 2001 
we get message from the ancestor, we have to show it again. After more than 600 years, then 2001, we changed the name, it's become Ciptaglar, which is the time to show up again. Indonesian people call us, we bring new cultures, because it almost disappeared, this, uh, our cultures. But exactly we are really old and really ancient about our culture. And this is also uh, like a, a, com a comparison between uh, our traditional way with uh, the Green Revolution, 1966 something, what happened is really like uh, in the opposite side, in the opposite way. We are planting rice for our life, not to sell and not for sale. Because life, not for selling. But everybody who's coming to our kingdom will have their own rice, will have their life. But also we can make money for other things, not, for, not from rice, of course. Uh, at the other side, also I can say, we still have meat a lot. We have hunting season three times a year. During hunting season, only three days, we uh, we hunt deer. We still have deer because we are living in the mountain for 40,500 hectare or something like that. Still in the really like a forest. And also, every animal who's living with us, with us every plant who's growing around us, that's for us, for people, that's in our belief. So that's why, talking about rice, talking about ourselves, rice grow because of us, we alive because of the rice. And then, here, we are as a human being, Everything's living around us and following us. Nobody plan, nobody food, nobody buy. Like, if someone build house, is there anyone who put the mother of cockroach in their house, or the mothers of rats, or a kind like the animal things who sleeping in the house in our house, or perhaps uh, ant. Nobody, but they are coming with us. So we as human beings has to be like trees who everything could alive around the trees. With the trees, monkeys, birds, snake, everything just alive around us, around the trees should be like that. This is the symbol of gunungan or in uh, wayang golek something. Or in every wayang we have this uh, symbol of life and living, who's also living with us, not just uh, not just uh, what is that, the dragon? Dragon also symbol of between left and right side of living and also talking about knowledge and everything about life and living. You see, at the end, still, star, what Japanese call Subaru, but what we call Kerti, which is also pointing to the point when we could start our life following the star. That's the symbol still there. And at the end, this is our army. We call Polda. Polisi Batu. Thank you, Mohon. Thank you, and thank you. Thank you very much, Yoyo. I think you moved a lot of people here in the room. And I have now the honor to bring you over there for the discussion. And Kurt, you did a wonderful first job in improvising. I give you. <laughs> Okay, I will, I, will, I will try again. Can we go back one slide? Okay. Um. Yo, yo. Thank you for the wonderful presentation.
I enjoyed it a lot. I'm going to be very honest with you now. Um, I'm, I don't want to walk around with a bag of rice every day. I'm just honest about it. Um, and actually, I also don't want to go back to the food production system of my grandfather, because I think he had a wonderful life, but I still think my life is more interesting. Um, but still, I think we can learn a lot from you. We can learn so much from you, because what you were teaching us, and I think this wonderful image shows it, is I would, for lack of a better term, call it ecological intelligence. And this sentence, I'm just going to read it out loud. It is our duty as human beings to nurture and protect, protect the whole living creature in the universe with knowledge and kindness. And this is not about going back to some setting from the past, but it's about knowledge. It's about ecological intelligence. And we have to figure out a way to do that. Well, in this country, with uh, 17 million people on such a small scale, we cannot copy your rice fields and rebuild them because there are too many people and not enough space. But we can maybe learn from the dynamics, and then I repeat, the ecological intelligence. And, and that brings me to, to you, Klaas. Um, because you gave us some bad news, and, but also some, some good news, I think. Um, there's no food security without nutrition security. I think that's really a truth. We have to look into that. Uh, the hidden hunger, that, that's something I, I never saw it, but you made it visible. Um, and then overweight increases more rapidly than the hunger decreases. So that's, 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 that's not a positive story so far, but you ended also with this notion that the private sector is changing. And earlier we were talking about what feeds the system, um, what is the metabolism of the system. And I think if we can go to this notion of ecological intelligence, what I see here, and maybe put also the private sector here and people there, and then make this interesting network that is an ecology in its own right, learning from practices in the world that are still very vibrant and ecologically sound, um, then maybe we can get somewhere. Thank you, and I don't have a question for you right now, but maybe there are questions in the audience. Thank you. Of course. I don't, I don't want to turn positives into negatives here. Eh? That don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Yeah, well, we have to face it. But anyway, I, what I'm interested in is, of course, this private sector going into uh, uh, developing countries. Uh, is there a relationship with the fact that now all of a sudden obesitas is exploding in those countries as well? Have you, is, is there any investigation? I'm not saying that it is. I'm just curious if there is a relationship between more processed food being sent to these countries and the problem of obesitas, because that would also uh, pose another challenge to, let's say, the positive that is also part of that story. He doesn't have a mic, so I'm moderating. Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's definitely true. You see a lot of processed foods like yogurts where a lot of sugar is added, where, where that is happening. Um, so there's definitely that, that negative effect. But I think there's also opportunities to work together, together with companies to find ways in which uh, the incentive from the company as well as the incentive to, to create a, a world with better nutrition uh, can happen and investigate that. And definitely there also that's uh, where you have to break the silos between the different actors. So what is the government doing when, when companies like that com come into a country and what is what are uh, civil society organizations doing about uh, those kinds of processed foods, for example? Yeah. I wonder in the audience uh, who who believes that we can do it or totally not. But now maybe I'm taking a role I should not take. No, it's great. Go ahead. Okay. Go for it. Right. So we have this, this notion of uh, that we know that many things have been lost because 
uh, food systems were not geared at the needs of people anymore, right? Is it fair to say that? In the past, at least. Klaas says it's, it's shifting. Do we believe it? Or not? I'm just curious. Yeah, the question is, uh, do we believe there's a future in a food system uh, in which the private sector plays a different role than the one from the past, which is actually more positive and geared at the needs of people? It's long, but you, you will get it, right? No, yeah. And you have to... Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's more green than red. Do you want to respond? Well, the, I think there are uh, examples. Well, first of all, you say geared towards the needs of people. That's demand. Companies respond to demand. So if that's the needs of people, then it's possible. Of course, there are bad guys. But um, let me give an example. We are working on uh, nutrition-sensitive cash crops. There's, there's areas in, in the world where we, where we saw that. Uh, malnutrition uh, data or uh, indicators are very, very bad, and that's the, the cocoa uh, that we eat and the coffee that we drink. Um, but there we're looking at can we make cash crop nutri nutrition sensitive? So can we uh, find ways where intercropping I is happening? And um, if people eat healthier, they get more productive. So uh, is that's in the interest of companies <laughs> that their farmers get more productive? They deliver more goods, but at the same time they eat healthier. So working along that line. There are opportunities, but we have to find them still. All right. Uh, I would like to shift to Yoyo -Yo because I think we can learn a lot from you here uh, today. Is this this matter something you want like, want to respond on? We are in the situation that our food system is uh, in the hands of companies, and what we eat is determined by the companies. Arne was referring to two billion interactions every day with human beings. That was one just one company, Unilever. It was right. Um, you want to respond? Uh, in our tradition, we have to plan. Everybody has to plan. Everybody, everybody has to be a farmer for themselves, not for anybody, uh, for, not for, for anybody, but has to prepare the food for tomorrow by themselves, which is also, this is perhaps, perhaps, uh, we can use here because uh, if everybody uh, planting for themselves, which is also they secure their own food. But also our food is of course talking about life, but perhaps the meaning of life here will be different. It's, it's really possible, why not? Thank you, but what do you advise? Because I'm not making my own food, and I'm not the only one. There are about one person here makes the food for 125 people. That's the situation right now. So is that something, do you say like, stop and, and go back? Or how to move uh, forward? Because honestly, I, if I work eight hours a day, um, I'm spending it on a lot of things, which are also very interesting. Um, so I'm not going to spend it on, f on food production. Um, what is your advice? Am I, should I turn back and stop or can I find a way forward? I I'm, I'm really want to hear. Something really, the wisdom perhaps, if you like to hear. I would like to invite Fadil because his English is better than me. There are proverbs. There is a proverb from the elders. Kutu tongo walang tage. Setiap makhluk anu hirup pasti dirizkian diberedaharna jeng rejekina. It is even really difficult for me to, but I will try. I will try because comparing to you guys, I'm the best at it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, every living creatures here, not only human, right? Every living creatures, there is always, uh, how do you call it? Gift, there is always gift. So you are here living in this world. You already have anything you need 
with you. So don't be scared. That is actually what, what, what Yo-Yo is trying to say. Because uh, Arne said before that what's driven the system is fear, right? We always fear about anything we don't know, actually. Not anything harm us, but anything we don't know. But Yo-Yo is trying to say that don't, don't be fear and to believe and just believe that whatever you need, you already have it. You just don't know. That's great. Thank you. So thank you, speakers. Terima kasih. Nuhun. Thank you, Kurt. Um, we have two more fantastic speakers. Um, I'll hand over to Bärbel. Yeah. Chris, can you come? Chris van der Veld, he is uh, the director for city farming at Philips. Correct. Correct. Yes. What are you caring for? Most. As a person, I care about enjoying the world I live in and also trying to leave it a little bit better for my children, doing whatever little I can. Um, professionally, I am, and actually people that are working at Philips on, on this beautiful technology are very passionate about using the innovation power that we have to also help address some of the issues we're talking about tonight. Thank you. Yep. Now this is your place to well, be. Don't, don't count on it, I'll move around. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, thank you for also having me here. It's a uh, it's very, very fun, interesting part to, uh, even to be part of. And I'm, I'm here to give a little bit of insight from the other side, sometimes even the dark side. Um, <laughs> we're, we're engineers, we're private sector, we're greedy. Um, <laughs> we, we basically, we're doing this. Well, actually, we're also even looking at developing countries. You're trying to make something that works anywhere in the world. Um, and we're, we don't even pre pretend or, or even think that we have a solution that will feed the world, but we think we can make a contribution. Um, except for all the other things that we are, greedy engineers, we're also people that are passionate, committed, look, thinking about the world, fathers, mothers, um, foodies, citizens, connected people. So with that background, that's actually how we are um, developing our little bit of contribution to what we're doing, and we're building things like this. This is a city farm, and a city farm is pretty much what it looks like. It's a, it's a box that has racks of, of, of plants. These racks have lots of lighting, and that's also why we're Philips. Um, and with, these light, with this lighting, we also provide climate control, uh, an air conditioner, um, and uh, food. We provide food and water to the plants. And in, in a nutshell, what we create here is a, uh, a uh, Groundhog Day for plants. It's every day. It's the very same day. It's spring. It's always a very nice temperature. It never, it never rains too much or too little. It's never dry. It's never not too windy. Um, and with that, we actually create an environment where plants thrive. They grow fast and they grow very, very healthily and nutritionally. It's, it's funky. The color of light. That's made something, of course, that that will interest you. It's, it's kind of pinkish. Why is it pink? There are signs behind that. It's, um, uh, we've actually, um, uh, with some of our friends that are the plant scientists, people from Wageningen as well, figured out what colors of light matters, m matter most to plants. And um, it, it's also a little bit of an economical uh, uh, thing, but red light and blue light are very important for the growth of plants, so we use both. And then you get something that's predominantly this color. Um, I would like to go into this also a little bit why we're doing that. Um, Philips actually as a company cares also about the world and uh, in the mission statement of Philips it says that we uh, aim to improve the lives of 3 billion people. It doesn't quite say which 3 billion people by the way and there's about 7.3 uh, in the world right now. Um, but uh, anyway, I think it's a healthy ambition. There are 3 billion people is, is actually quite a lot and it's, uh, it takes a pretty big company to also be able to address that. Um, if we go back to um, uh, uh, what we can do about it, uh, maybe you can go to the next slide. There are some challenges, and I, I think also they, they were already, you know, hinted upon or talked about before. Um, yeah, give the next one. First of all, growing population. Actually, I just checked on my phone: 7.316 billion people today, and uh, and counting. Um, and these people live, um, and next one, predominantly more and more in cities, and that already actually presents a challenge that requires technology to solve it. 
none of us, well, most of us would not be here if we didn't have technology to feed us. Also, the thing, the products that we today eat every day, um, they, need, they don't need to be processed or anything. It can be a very natural product, but still it comes out of greenhouse. Or it has been grown using fertilizers or other technologies. Basically, if you do not use the technology at all, and we had a very brilliant presentation about how that works at all, then the amount of people that you can sustain is going to be limited. So you need technology. Next one. Uh, the other one that's a concern with the um, uh, in increasing amount of people that we have in the world and uh, the also climate change issues that we're facing is the availability of good water. Agri agriculture already uses the most of the drinking water that's available in the world and there are some very interesting challenges. For instance, um, if you live in New York, you uh, can go to the supermarket and you can buy a head of lettuce there and that the head of lettuce will have been grown in a f valley in California which hasn't seen rain for a few years give or take a little bit here and there, which means that they're using rerouting rivers from all kinds of places in, in the country to get water to this particular place because that's where the farmers are. Then they put, harvest this, uh, this, this head of lettuce, they put it on a train or a truck or an air, or airplane, and they'll bring it to New York, and by the time it gets to New York, it's about five days old and not really good for eating anymore. That's what Americans do. Um, and also, of course, in many other places, also in, in, in places where there, there just isn't enough water, also there is a limited amount of food then. Go on. Food safety is also an issue. Um, the, um, uh, it depends a little bit on where you are, uh, but uh, again, uh, most of our uh, folks has been on looking also at developing countries. We just saw the picture of uh, Fukushima, what happened after, uh, there, and the pollution and, and devastation that that, that that caused. In Japan, people today are still concerned about eating vegetables that have been grown outdoors because they do not know there is no radioactivity in there. So they actually prefer to, grow, to, to buy food that has been grown in an artificial environment without any influence from the outside because they know it's clean. Uh, similar issues is, exist in China where also a lot of the arable land, and that was also I think in the first presentation, uh, has been, say, rendered a little bit less optimal for food uh, production because of human influence. It's polluted. Um, finally, also food accessibility. Uh, there are many places in the world where there are people now that there didn't used to be think about the Arctic or think about desert uh, climates where it traditionally is not easy to, to grow food and therefore the food needs to be brought in from far, far away. Well, we have uh, built our activity to see what we can do at least a little bit about that. And um, next one. So what do we do? We grow lettuce. Um, it's not the most nutritional, nutritious crop that's out there in the world, but it's one that you can do fairly easily and it's a good place to begin, we think. So what does it do? Um, first of all, uh, what we create, and that's going back to the first picture that you saw there, we can create an extremely efficient, high yield way of farming. It is farming, by the way. This is real farming. There's nothing artificial there. The plant does its own thing. It's a, it's, it's a seed that grows from a small seed into a full plant. It does it fast, it does it very well, and it tastes extremely nicely. We have also done um, uh, tests and comparisons also with, 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 with foodies, with chefs, other people. The quality of what you get out of these things is, is good. You like it. Um, second, it's a very efficient use of space. You've seen the racks, it's, it's the, the vertical stacking. Uh, basically, on one square meter, you can get the, the equivalent of, say, 9, 10, 12, however high you want to go, square meters of production area. And the square meters that we have actually are much more productive than anything you can see outside. In a typical system that, uh, that, that we're designing now, you can go up to way above 100 kilograms per, uh, of, of production per year, which you will not see anywhere else. Um, water use, uh, because it's a fully um, closed environment, the real, really the only water you're using, give or take a little bit extra, is the water that goes into the plant. The rest you can recycle, which means that the, therefore also compared to go doing outdoor, outdoor growing, where most of the water actually evaporates, this is, going, it, this is a very, very efficient way of, of, of um, plant production. Um, also, because it's inside, indoors, and we make sure we have good filters and, and, and no, 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 no uh, uh, pests or animals can get in, you don't need to use pesticides. It's basically whatever you grow you can eat. You can harvest it right away and, and just uh, eat it. And finally, um, you can, these things, of course, can be built wherever you want them. It's not dependent on climate. It's not dependent on, uh, on, on, on anything else. If you have the, uh, the, the availability of sufficient energy and, and, and you can build a facility, you can grow locally, and that's also what happens. So if you see where these things are now being built, 
Uh, I think that's also important to say. It's, it's not for free. It, this is a young technology. It's, it requires a lot of investment. Uh, it's mostly in the developed world, uh, and it is in places where other food is not available and people are willing also to invest in, in, in getting the right kind of uh, vegetables locally. It's, it's young, it's happening now, uh, which means that in a few years from now, and that's also something I would like to invite people that are interested to think along with, we can drive down the costs, we can make it better. We are engineers, of course, so we, we, we try to find ways to optimize and see how we can also make this thing available to a much wider audience. Next slide, please. So what we, do, we build farms today. Um, next slide. Uh, next, uh, Philips as a company has about 30 years of horticulture experience. Um, um, if you're Dutch or you live in this country, you're probably familiar with the uh, sodium lights that are used in greenhouses, the, the, the yellowish light that comes out of these things. That's Philips. Um, and um, the, um, uh, and then and we, we, are, we are finding now ways to make that light also better because also you, what you're doing here you of course can also do in a greenhouse and there you can also use lights that use much less power and much more be much better at growing plants. Um, as a company of course we have a broad technology background so we do, don't only do lights but we're looking at things that are to, to combine it all to build a integrated system that combines lighting, climate, the software controls that you need to do this properly and also the, the, the sensors to calibrate the whole system, so you also uh, make sure that when it works today, it still works tomorrow. Um, what's also very important in our approach is the, um, the need to cooperate uh, across the, the chain. Um, it's, not, it's not if we build an optimum system, everything will be solved. No, you need to work together with others. Philips doesn't do seeds, for instance. Seeds are very, very important. The right quality of seeds is very important to me also get the right quality of, of, of product and also to help, again, the development of the technology or the production capacity that goes well with this uh, approach. So we work with the, uh, the, the seed producer, uh, producers, but we also need to understand what the retail wants because supermarkets actually determine what you and I eat, which means that if the supermarket doesn't, uh, doesn't want to sell it, then we have an issue. So it's also important that we work with the supermarkets to understand what they think you want to eat so that we can make what they think you want to eat so you'll have it in time for when you're ready for it. But you don't know what you want to eat yet. But anyway, so we'll work that out over time. Um, finally, of course, there's engineering innovation. Uh, that's, that's what we do, that's what we like, we're the engineers. And the last one, um, and that also helps quite a lot actually. Philips, of course, is a company that is not just here in Eindhoven. It's uh, fun to be here in this building, by the way. Um, it used to be Philips, of course. Um, the, um, uh, but it, we have a global press and, and that also helps us to also deliver this, this promise, this idea to anywhere in the world. So right now we're focusing on, on say, the, the developed world, Japan, China, the United States, Europe, etc. But there's nothing that says this cannot be done in developing countries, it just needs a little bit more work. Um, I also have, I think if you hit it three times, I'll show you a few pictures. Yes, uh, so these are some examples of things that we've actually realized. Um, at the bottom is a customer of ours in uh, close to Chicago in the United States. They have actually uh, created a startup, uh, bought a v empty uh, facility, they filled it up with racks, put in the lights, and they're, they're now producing uh, various kinds of lettuces and herbs, and selling this to a supermarkets in, in the Chicago region and doing quite well. Um, the other one is uh, what I also mentioned in, in Japan. Um, uh, there's Osaka Prefecture University that is investing quite a lot of, of research into this area. They've built a big facility also with our support. And uh, also what you see there, the they're, they're Japanese like their lettuce a little bit smaller than we do, but it is lettuce. And uh, they are also selling that, so if you go there, be sure to try it out. And finally, uh, Brightbox, this is actually in, in Venlo, just down the road from here in the old Floriada building, if you, uh, if you know where that is, uh, where we also have just opened up a, a R&D development test uh, research facility uh, where we work with, with uh, partners and, 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 and customers to also further develop this, this approach. And next one. So then the question, and that uh, uh, is not really a statement, but it, it is where I started. It's, we have a technology here and an approach that helps to solve some of the issues in, about food quality and food availability that we, that we mentioned. But then the question is, which three billion are we gonna hit first? Um, and um, if you, on, on the right side, you see actually a product that was grown in a city farm, uh, and there we are looking at um, five and a half ounce, so that's maybe 150 grams for $5. 
that may not be for everyone. Um, so that's, but that is, that is the reality of today. And the question is, how can we get something that actually also works in the left scenario? And um, I don't really have the answer for that either, except that we just keep working on it to see what we can do. But maybe also you have some thoughts about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to, uh, because your question, here are a lot of uh, technology um, designers present in the room. So what I want to do is now, um, one minute, just to think on this paper, your question, once again. How can we, uh, basically, I, I know, I have an approach to, to uh, change the lives of the three billion richest people. What can we do to also uh, uh, reach the people that are not so rich? With, with, with an engineering approach. One minute. <laughs> Okay, you get you get your answers um, afterwards. Good, excellent. At the drink, yes. because we collect all the uh, answers. Well, thank you very much already. Thank you very much. Okay, and now I you may uh, you can sit over there. And I would like to introduce. We have to see. Uh, we have to. We, yeah, in the light. Okay. So this is Maria Teresa Nogales. You are from Bolivia, Bolivia and you care mostly about what I had said is integrity, because I think integrity has to do with our body, our mind, and our spirit. Thank you. Okay. So I'm actually going to sit down just to feel a little more comfortable. Um, no. Should I just start in the meantime? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, let's see. So um, we've heard a lot of things tonight, and I think uh, everybody has said some pretty amazing things. Higher? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try and keep this very short because I think everyone's already a little overwhelmed with a lot of data. But um, basically, I think we're living in some very confusing times um, because beyond the data on malnutrition and erosion and climate change and all this stuff. You know, when we think about food, we go to the grocery store and we see a lot of food and we see more and more grocery stores um, and we go to the markets, maybe in our uh, other countries, and we see a lot of food, uh, a lot of food that's rotting. Um, we walk through our neighborhoods and there's more restaurants and, you know, suddenly in Bolivia there's Thai food and Vietnamese food and, you know, stuff that we didn't have 20 years ago. So, so it's funny because when we start to talk about food security and we, we reach out to people to say, hey, you know, there's a problem and we really need to work together on this, people look at you and say, you're crazy. I just went to the market and there's a ton of food. Um, so I think it's very confusing um, for a lot of people to hear that we have this growing problem that's called food security. I think it's, for a lot of people, it's hard to think that their kids might not uh, be able to access food as easily as we can. Um, but of course, you know, we're not looking um, into what's really behind those labels and what's really going on in our food system. Um, and we're definitely not thinking about the unsustainability of our food system. 
Um, it's funny because uh, in my few days in the Netherlands, um, I've been able to not only eat quinoa, but also visit a supermarket this morning and see that there's a lot of quinoa options. Um, and I think that's great. Uh, and I'm sure Bolivian farmers are, are very happy that, you know, the world wants to eat quinoa because, um, you know, they're selling it at a price they've never sold it before. Um, so, so that means a lot of things. But it also, you know, it means a house and it means a, uh, I don't know, school for their kids and it means uh, nice sheets or curtains or whatever. Um, but it also means that they're not willing to eat it anymore. And if you ask them uh, if they eat quinoa, they will tell you, I would never eat gold because I, would not, I don't want to eat my computer or my future home or my future car. Um, but that's the thing, you know, uh, I think Bolivians don't necessarily want to discourage people from eating quinoa because, again, that means greater income for our farmers. So they're not eating quinoa anymore, but they're definitely making a lot more money. Um, but the question is, uh, what are they doing with that money in terms of, you know, what food are they spending that money on? And I think uh, a lot of that goes back to um, what Klaus was saying um, when it, uh, you know, when we talk about nutritional security. Um, you know, our farmers are now eating pasta and rice and more and more bread, which definitely makes them go to bed with a, a full stomach. Um, but it doesn't mean their kids are not falling asleep at school um, because, you know, they have no nutrients um, and they're definitely not getting the proteins that they used to get from quinoa. So to make a long story short, um, I um, have this organization called Alternativas. Um, it's a small nonprofit organization that's headquartered in La Paz, Bolivia. Um, and what we're trying to do is actually get um, the issue of urban food security uh, on the policy agenda. Um, but also we're looking to empower our citizens so that um, every single person can start to be a little bit more conscientious about our food system. Um, and can actually play a more active role if they choose to um, in guaranteeing their own right to food. Um, and so why is this an issue? Because, well, you know, much like quinoa, uh, this is happening with uh, other products and it's happening not only in Bolivia but all around the world. Um, but just a couple of extra data, uh, not that you haven't had enough tonight, but 20% um, of Bolivians uh, are food insecure, so that means one out of five people. So if we were all Bolivians, that means a lot of people in this room. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, the global economy for agricultural products is changing our agricultural landscape. So today, 80% of what we're producing is actually soy, and it's for export, for biofuels. Um, so that's taking a lot of land that used to be uh, for other products. Um, and that also, all, all that together, means that we're importing 60% of our food today. Um, Bolivia, which used to have a... a pretty important uh, agricultural economy is now importing 60% of its food. So what does this mean? This means a lot of things. It means we're dependent on other people for our food. It means we're vulnerable um, to market changes and to uh, market prices. Um, and it definitely means that we don't have food security or food sovereignty. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, this all boils down to social justice um, because somebody else eventually will decide whether um, one person eats or does not, no? Um, so just to show you a little bit of what we're doing in Bolivia. Um, again, uh, our name is Fundación Alternativas and our slogan is cultivating community because um, we're actually working with the human component of food security. Um, and we're not only cultivating community, we're trying to do it through meaningful change. So we are trying to actually do our part to change the system, if just a little bit. Um, and the way that we do it, uh, we have a multi-sectoral approach, so we work with the private sector, we also work with civil society, and importantly, we're working with our public sector and our local governments. But of course, everything begins with the people, so, um, you know, our policy work is people-driven. We bring people together from different sectors, um, everybody from the syndicates to uh, the Chamber of Commerce, to the slow food movements. Um, but additionally, in our urban agriculture initiatives, uh, we're working directly with citizens. So we're actually, um, unlike uh, other 
countries around the world, we are the, the concept of urban agriculture is foreign to us, primarily because uh, we used to be such an, a rural country and, and had so much agriculture. But um, so today we're, we're basically introducing the concept of urban agriculture and we're doing door-to-door -door campaigns, um, inviting people to come out to the country's first community gardens um, so that they can actually empower themselves and, and go back to their roots and, and reconnect with the earth and, and change some of their behaviors. And as I said before, I think importantly, we're shaping the political environment, so we're definitely um, making sure that our if, uh, elected officials and also civil servants are aware of the problems that are going on in our communities. Um, and we are working together with them and with these, uh, all these other actors um, to try and actually not only state that there's a problem, um, but start working together so that together we can come up with the solutions because um, at the end of the day, um, as we've reflected over the evening, um, food um, involves all of us and therefore all of us have to also um, feel free to contribute uh, our thoughts in terms of what the solutions are. And by doing these things, uh, we believe that we're, you know, we're strengthening the social fabric and we, we, we think that uh, these actions can ensure that our communities are resilient in the future. Um, especially for the younger generations, which are probably the ones that are going to see um, the biggest changes uh, rather than us. No? So my question for the evening was, how can we do this together? Because clearly there's a lot of people working on this, but clearly there's still a big problem, so clearly there's still a lot to do. Um, so, you know, let's try and find a way to do this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. May I give you for the last round? Good. Please. Yes, I would like to begin by complimenting you and your fellow organizers, organizers by having this uh, wonderful diversity of, of, of speakers. Because it's rarely that you are in an event that there's such a nice diversity of different voices and different perspectives, which makes it, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, wonderfully done. Um, and then, um, yeah, my final reflection. You are also so different. Uh, <laughs> but then, yeah, I think, <laughs> could, you, could you work uh, uh, together? Where to start? I think I want to begin by asking uh, you, Maria Teresa, a, a question. Um, what Gus presented, you, you made this point of social justice, which I think is extremely important. And what is your perspective? Do you think... Uh, the technologies Gus is presenting can contribute to social justice, or is that something else altogether? Thank you. Um, actually, so I think there's not one solution to food security, and I think it's a very diverse world and there needs to be very diverse solutions. So I actually think that what we're doing is very complementary because um, here, you know, we have these $5 lettuces, which are for 3 billion people. Um, but additionally, what Alternativas is looking to do is perhaps work with the other 4.3 billion people. Yeah? Thank you. So that together you covered everything. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, I, I, I want to reflect still also a bit on, on your work, uh, Gus. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating, you know? It's, uh, you, it feels like the future, also because it's purple. <laughs> And it's, but it's also a bit uncanny because it's purple. Mm -hmm. yeah? I, I, you must run into these feelings people have. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, at a certain moment then I think, but what if you would, we would have this discussion maybe 10,000 years ago, and then you would be the one, we would all be cavemen, living the hunting gathering lifestyle on the savanna. You know, that's something different. That's before agriculture. So agriculture didn't exist yet. We were just in the woods, hunting and gathering, finding some, uh, some of these uh, quinoa uh, and stuff. <laughs> and that would be our life. And then we would have 10,000 years ago, uh, the ancestor of Gus, and he would tell us like, stop hunting, gathering, get into agriculture. Settle down, plant crops, 
wait for them to grow, and then harvest them. Um, at that moment, that might also have been uncanny, because at the beginning of agriculture, it was also a radical intervention that humanity was I intervening in the natural environment uh, with this new technology. And um, yeah, I, I think you're doing something similar, um, but then in, in our time. Um, and maybe, maybe we just have to get used to it. I'm not sure. It is, I'm, I am ambivalent. And maybe rightly so. Um, then to finalize with one question that I wonder is um, what does it mean for the plants to grow? Is this for them a horror or is it the ultimate like uh, abundance? Do you have some data on that? <laughs> well data um, um, uh I, th I think, well, the, the, we, um, if you look at the ultimate abundance, well, the one thing we haven't done yet is play Bach to them. <laughs> so that's something we can still try. Uh, but if you look at the data we get from actual production figures and, and plant health measurements that we can use, basically using the science approach to, to try to measure how the plants feel, they're happy. They're having a field day. <laughs> so they, 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 they're extremely healthy. They, are, they, they grow very fast. And it's also, as I also mentioned in my speech, uh, the product also for the, uh, say, uh, non-technical uh, uh, person experiencing it, they like it. And we, we've uh, really seen that. And uh, on, as to the color, it's changing, by the way. It's becoming wider and wider. Also helped by technology because the, 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 the quality of the LEDs is improving and the price is dropping. And that's also making the technology a little bit closer to home. And we see that as well, by the way. That's, that's a very, very valid comment. Maybe, maybe you could also still respond to the question, can your technology uh, not only feed more people, but also help in the question of s social justice, which is so important? Um, in a way, yes. Um, I think primarily then also folks at, at an urban world in terms of um, um, food, and I think it was extremely well put also in, 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 in one of the first talks, is an extremely important element in, in the social fabric of, of, of any culture. And having f food available and having good food available is, is making a difference. You, so you also see a lot of urban farming um, uh, initiatives in, in a very different type of underprivileged environment, which is the inner cities of the United States. There are also a lot of people that get most of their uh, vegetable nutrition through ketchup and pizza. Now, what can we do to also give these people access to fresh vegetables that are actually produced very locally, very close to them, and also allow these people to actually have a job in food production right in the inner city. So these things are actually happening. Um, it will not right away solve the issue of the $5 lettuce. It's not quite $5, but still, it, we, we, it's, it's, it's too expensive. And I think one of the ways that we can, of course, improve that is by doing just more of it and getting down the, uh, the cost curves. But that's uh, economics. Well, thank you. You presented yourself as someone from the other side. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, I get the feeling we're on the same side. Um, all together. So thank you. Maybe there are questions from the audience. Yeah, I come with the microphone. I have a question for Gus because I was wondering. You presented actually a super clear solution to us, but then the story kind of stops where it becomes real. So I was wondering why? Why is this sell at five dollars? Are you making profit on it or? Um, <laughs> We uh, obviously well we we're, we're not making the salad. That's our customers that that make that that uh, create the salads. Um, we are at the uh, at, at it, it is a very young technology. It needs a lot more work to become fully mature. It is the, it's it's in, in its first applications now, and you see people building these farms, and also these things being are being used commercially. But right now, it's just not very well engineered yet. It's new. So we think we can do a lot to further improve the technology, to go down the cost curves. We're also benefiting from the, the world changing over to LED lighting, which is also helping us quite a lot. Uh, we are also looking at other nice innovations that we, 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 we can do. So we, there is still a lot of uh, progress to be made. But today, if you want to build one of these farms and you want to run it for a profit, then you need to be able to uh, get the prices that are at the point where they are now. I think.
if we come back two, three, four, five years from now, it's going to be a different story. Not only because the lettuce itself will be cheaper, but also because we will be able to produce a lot more different plants. In the end, feeding a world on lettuce and maybe strawberries is, is not going to help us too much. We will need to also look at other kinds of crops to, uh, to put in these facilities. There's a question in the back. I'm running? Yeah. No, I'm running. <laughs> it's good, you know, it's uh, healthy and stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Also a question for Gus. Uh, the picture where you mentioned, can the solution on the right scenario also work on the left scenario on the market? My question is, can you imagine um, research and development world where you come from, where this question is already asked at the beginning? Can you imagine such a world? And then the next question is, if you can imagine such a world, what would your product look like? I also believe actually there's a good amount of people that, are, that, that work on exactly those issues. Um, um, then the solution would be uh, a lot lower tech. It would be something that probably would require a lot less uh, education and, 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 and electricity and, and other kinds of advanced uh, things to, to run. Um, and actually in many, many cases, to be honest, you can already make a vast difference by also just teaching people how to grow properly, not doing anything else but just education. So there are definitely solutions that we can apply today, including also, by the way, lo working with local governments and people to uh, wor you know, work together and get things done. Um, and that's also not something that I think, uh, throwing technology at the issue, uh, that problem is not going to be the first, uh, first solution. Uh, that's more difficult. <laughs> Um, I, I, th I think there it's, um, uh, it's more likely that we come in from the top and that we find a solution that first works for a few people and then extend it to a lot more. Okay, <clears throat> I think I'm looking at time and um, <clears throat> I want to um, thank you very much. Wait, 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 wait. Before <laughs> now we start. Before we um, before I start. Uh, before we start thanking the uh, the speakers, I would like to uh, first of all. I would like really to thank the audience. Have you felt the admin, the energy here in the room? How you listened? How you carefully listened? How you listened with with an open mind? How you were just open? And this was so nice. And this you can feel it. And I really want to thank you so much for being here, being open, thinking of solutions, and helping HIVOS, the Balton, um, Balton Laboratory, and the Dutch Design Week um, to come to new solutions. We have a good news. It's the first, it's the first um, event out of three more coming up this year, so you get to know. So, and this um, um, event is streamed um, live, it's live streamed, you, so you can, if you want to listen to Arne again, because he was very, uh, very, very sharp and very condensed, so you can do it again, you can link also other people. So, um, and now I want to um, thank first the speakers, before I come to thank you to the, really, to the ones that are behind the scenes that did a, did a very big job. So, first the speakers, and we have, and we have, we have a special, can you come up, all of, us, all of you, can you come up? The speakers, please. So we start. <laughs> and as I think as Kurt said uh, correctly, that is uh, such a diversity with so much knowledge and so much love for the subject and we have a special book for you and it's not a, it's a very special book because it's a book from our our uh, reflector <laughs> spontaneous <laughs> reflector so maybe you can just uh, two two oh, sentences two sentences yes. not more um, because they have to read it cookbook <laughs> no. uh, this is the in vitro meat cookbook with 45 uh, in vitro meat lab grown meat recipes you cannot cook just yet however it will be uh, provide you abundant food for thought and and it is a special, it's a special um, exemplar. It's a red one, so it's a very special one. And you get, you get a special signature afterwards. 
So, so, <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I want to really special thank you to you, Kurt. You, um, yeah, I called you and I told you what what um, what role you uh, I could give you, and it was so nice that you said, "Hey, I want to do it spontaneously. I I like this w way." And you, I think you did a fantastic job in uh, in bringing the people together, reflecting on with your ideas on them. It was fantastic. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure and I'm also looking forward as the new ambassador of the Dutch Design Week uh, to be back here uh, and uh, again in the Dutch Design Week. Wonderful. Yeah, we are, we are coming back. We are coming back. And now I want to really thank you two persons. Please, can you stand up? Um, Alan and uh, Timo, please, please. Can, come, please come. Come on, on the floor, please come, because you did so much work behind the scenes until the last moments. You made this happen and I'm really very thankful for all your work and the work of Olga. Ye uh, yesterday night at quarter to, to 12, she organized the live stream just in one second. <laughs> so it was, and it's really amazing how much positive energy we felt, how much positive energy was, was given to this event. And I'm really thank you. And the last one, Tizia, hello. <laughs> this lady in the back, she helped us so much with the, uh, setting up the whole uh, technology and the, uh, and the venue. And now <clears throat> I have the um, honor to invite you for drinks and also some s small snacks. Just if you go out and then you go right, and then he was in the Walton Lab and the um, and uh, Age of Wonderland invite you for for a drink and a snack and just to to talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>